Let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, if you would. Matthew 7, I'm going to spend pretty much, if you open your Bible there, this will be a verse you're pretty familiar with, I'm guessing. Most people, most people are. We'll stay right there for the most part. I'm probably referring to a couple other verses, but we'll just pretty much camp right there. This afternoon service, I appreciate so much your being here and coming to the service. Some of you are visiting from other congregations, I'm guessing, and many of you are members at 6th Avenue after a good, good lunch. You've chosen to come and to be a part of the afternoon service. I'm glad for that. I appreciate it so much. Um, I, I mentioned uh, studying Bible class with you guys this morning about the spiritual but not religious, this, this uh, growing kind of movement in, in our country regarding the way people think about spiritual things. And, and the, the Rise of the Nuns was a book written in response to this, this idea that uh, the, the fastest growing, religiously speaking, the fastest growing segment of American population is that which includes people who claim no religion whatsoever, and yet they believe in God. They believe in God, may believe in Jesus, but they don't claim to be affiliated with any kind of outward expression of that, of that faith. So one of the things that flows out of that that we in churches have to think about is how are we going to reach the new world that we live in? It's, it's a lot different than it was 50 years ago. It's a lot different than it was 20 years ago. You know, how are we going to reach people who don't claim any kind of affiliation whatsoever and don't intend to? I think there, there are certain assumptions that we've made in the past regarding most people in the Bible Belt. In the area of the country where we live, most people believe in God. They believe in Jesus. They'd call themselves Christians, perhaps. And so we've gotten certain presuppositions, certain assumptions that we share in common, and we, are, we, we go from those assumptions to talk to them about other things. Our world is rapidly becoming a place where we cannot make those assumptions, that those things that we assumed were true 20 years ago, we can't assume them anymore, especially if a person is under, say, you know, 30 years old or, or whatever. We can't assume that. And so a lot of times, the, some of the old traditional methods that we've used in evangelism, gospel meetings, I think a gospel meetings accomplish some good purposes, I believe that, but they typically, at least in my experience, don't do a whole lot of evangelism anymore because people who need to hear the gospel usually aren't coming to gospel meetings anymore. Now, we can, you know, throw up our hands and say, well, the world is... Is, is, is an awful place and people aren't interested in spiritual things and all that. We can, we can do that and we're probably all we're going to do a little bit of hand-wringing. But another response is to say, well, the world is what the world is. So what are we going to do about it? What are we in churches going to do about it? What are we, how are we going to change our method? We're not talking about changing the essence of the gospel or what we hold to be true and what we hold to be very important. But we do as churches need to think about how we're going to... Um, share the gospel with a world that's different than it was 20 years ago, 50 years ago, or whatever. Now, I say that to say this. We're going to look at a very familiar passage, the golden rule in Matthew seven twelve, And what I want to suggest to you is as we think in churches about how to do this, how to be the presence of Jesus in the community where God has placed us, that one of the focal points of that needs to be that we as churches need to think about how to do ministry in the context of a local community where we can show people what it is to be a Christian. A lot of, a lot of people today, you know, their idea of Christianity, you know, whether we like it or not, their idea of Christianity is not good anymore. It, it may have been shaped purely by what they saw on Friends or Seinfeld a few years ago or The Office or Late Night Talk Show or... Or, or whatever it is, what they've what they've seen, what they hear in their music, and and various sorts of these these you know these uh, tributaries that flow into this idea that they've got of Christianity. And a lot of times that image isn't a, isn't a really good one. So they've got this perception of what a Christian is, and sometimes what they think of is that it's people who go to church and they wear their suits and their ties and their dresses. But then they go out and they don't live a life that's any different from everybody else. I don't think that's true, by the way. But it doesn't matter whether we think it's true or not. If people think it's true, then it's true for them, and it influences how they think about Christianity. So what we got to do is we got to think very introspectively and seriously about being the church outside of these walls, about helping people in our world who maybe they've never even seen what a real Christian looks like, talks like, thinks like, for those people to see a real Christian so that we might be able to have conversations about who Jesus is. 
Now, Matthew 7, 12 is a very familiar verse to us all. Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In, in a nutshell, what Jesus is doing is he's summing up the whole Sermon on the Mount. This comes near the end of it, as you know. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you get to near the end of uh, Matthew 7, and Jesus, I believe, in a lot of ways, is summing it all up. He's saying, I've been talking to you for two and a half chapters now. This is what it looks like. This is, you do to others what you wish they would do to you. And he says, this is the law of the prophets. And that's a phrase Jesus doesn't use flippantly, but it's an expression that he uses when he wants to say, this is a summation of what it means to be a follower of Christ. He would use it in Matthew 22, sometime after this, when he asked by that person, you know, what's the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first of great commandments. Second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophet. Remember that expression? On these two commandments. These are two pegs. And if you want to sum up what it means to be a child of God, if you want to sum up what it means to be a Christian, you put it in all those two pegs. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but you can't separate that from how you love people. And so Jesus uses the same expression here in Matthew 7, 12, when he says, the golden rule, this is the law and the prophets. This is, this is all of it. This is 39 books of the Old Testament. This is how you sum up what it means to relate to a holy God. Let me read you something here, a couple, couple of things, just to get us kind of primed for what he's going to teach us in this simple but powerful verse. I heard a story, I read a story about something that took place in the year 20 BC. So we're talking about 50 years or so before Jesus spoke the Sermon on the Mount. But it was a story told about a Gentile, you know, a non-Jewish person who approached Rabbi Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L. If you've read about first century world, uh, Hillel and Shemai were two of the influential rabbis of the day, of Jesus' day in the, in the decades prior to him. And so Hillel was pretty well known as being this great teacher of the, of the law. And the Gentile approached Hillel, and he asked him, he said, I will convert, the Gentile said this, I will convert to Judaism if you can teach me the entire law, law of Moses, while standing on one foot. I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but this is supposedly what he said. Just stand on one foot, tell me the entire law. If you can do that, I will convert to Judaism. Rabbi Hillel, again, this esteemed, uh, very influential rabbi of the day, picked up one foot, stood on the other, and he said, Do not do to your fellow what you hate to have done to you. This is the whole law. The rest is explanation. Put his other foot down. I don't know if the guy converted. I don't even know if that's a true story or not. But it's a pretty good way of summing it up, I think. He said, this is, this is how you sum up the law. This is Rabbi Hillel. This is how you sum up the law of Moses. If there's something that you hate to be done to you, don't do it to anybody else. That's what the law is about. Everything else is just explaining what that means. That's, how, that's the way the, the, the Rabbi Hillel put it. Let me read you a couple other things. The book, One of the books of the Apocrypha, which... Are some of those books written between Malachi and Matthew. It's during that time frame, not in the Bible. But one of them called the book of Tobit says this, What you yourself hate to no man do. Hear that? What you yourself hate to no man do. Confucius, of course not affiliated with Christianity or Judaism, said this, What you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. There was an ancient Greek king who put it like this, do not do to others the things which make you angry when you experience them at the hands of other people. So if something makes you mad, it's a pretty good rule, something makes you mad, you probably ought not do it to somebody else. It's not a good way to live. One, uh, two more. A Greek philosopher Epictetus said, what you avoid suffering yourself, do not afflict on others, end quote. So in other words, if, if there's something I don't like, then I probably ought not make one of you go through it. The Stoics, last one. The Stoics promoted this principle. What you do not want to be done to you, do not do to anyone else. So these are all um, kind of formulations that in some ways are similar to what we're reading in Matthew 7, you know. These are, these are some Confucius from Judaism, from Greek philosophy, and all these different kinds of teachings that are approximating what Jesus says in Matthew 7, 12. But I hope you noticed 
A very significant difference. I want to go back to the text. Matthew 7, 12. Whatever you wish that other would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What I want to do for the next few minutes is to focus mostly on three words in that verse. Three words of the golden rule. And, and my, my goal is for us to think, okay, here's what we need to do as, as individuals. And here's how we need to live corporately as a church in hopes that God will use this kind of spirit, this kind of life, and he'll not only be a blessing to us in the church, but he'll be a blessing to our communities in which God has placed us. So the people out there, they see, oh, those people at that church, something different about them. They, uh, they aren't like these Christians. I, I, thought, I thought Christians were like this and this, whatever that box is. You know, they don't seem to fit in that box when we live this out. Three words, okay, here they are. First word is the word do, D-O, do. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. Now here's the thing I want you to notice about this. Did you notice in all six or so of those other quotations I gave you a minute ago, did you, did you notice the difference? Were you, were you listening closely enough to notice the difference here? Let me, let me give, just give you a couple of them. What you yourself hate to no man do. What you do not want done to yourself, do not do it to others. Do not do to others the things which make you angry. What you avoid suffering yourself, do not afflict on others. What you do not want to be done for you, do not do to anyone else. You notice the difference? Jesus says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. I hope you noticed the, the very significant difference uh, between the, the way that it was perceived in the Jewish world, the Conf Confucian world, the Greek world, the philosophical world, that the big difference is... The way they formulated it was, hey, if I don't want you to do something to me, then I'm not going to do that to you. It's a negative formulation, whereas Jesus doesn't do it like that. He says, whatever you want people to do to you, you do that thing to them. See, the thing is, <coughs> I think most of us, most of us, for the most part, we're fairly good at not doing the bad things to people. In fact, man, I would find it a whole lot easier to do it according to Confucius' way than I would Jesus' way. You know? I mean, if it's not that hard. I mean, sometimes it's hard. But most of the time, it's not that hard not to do mean things to people. I mean, you may have to grit your teeth and white knuckle it, you know, or whatever. I'm not, oh, I want to hurt you right now. I want to say something mean to you right now. I want to do a bad thing, but I'm not going to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna, not going to do it, you know? I mean, yeah, that's hard sometimes. That's not what Jesus says, though. He, he ramps it up, and he says, the thing that you want done to you, you do that thing to somebody else. So it is active, not passive. That's a very, I hope you, I hope you, Read the golden rule like that because Jesus is formulating it very specifically and I think intentionally so to go against the prevailing kind of philosophy of his day. And a lot of times we might call somebody, we might say about somebody, man, he was a good person. He never did anything to hurt anybody. That's a great thing to say about somebody. I think Jesus is interested in something a little bit deeper than that though. Seems to me. She never, she never heard it. He wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, Jesus says, okay, that's good. What, 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 about, what about the way he or she actually actively love people? So that's the thing about Christianity. Jesus doesn't let us sit over here and, and just not hurt people. He doesn't, he doesn't just let us sit over here and passively, you know, let the world go by and, and, uh, and not be aggressively uh, evil to people or not be bad to people, not mistreat them. The word, key word in this text is do. You do to them. You do to them. And you think about the way, in fact, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the way Jesus uses this throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he is summing up the sermon. I mean, in Matthew 7, 12, like Jesus would do, great teacher, he's been talking for two over two chapters and he said a lot of stuff. And you go back and look at it. And Jesus is talking about what we do. What we do. He is saying to us in like verse 6, just prior to this, he says, do, do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. He talks about our, our judgmental spirit in, in the first part of this. But you go on back in the, in the chapter in verses, uh, look at the last part of chapter 5. You flip over one page or so or 
scroll up a little bit on your device. But look at, look at the last part of Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is, imper- is perfect. I mean, you, you, you look at this. He is saying that, that, that doing is not just passively allowing certain things or passively not doing something. In fact, some of the most difficult teachings in all of Scripture come from the mouth of Jesus in this sermon. Backing up a little bit more in the sermon in Matthew 5, 38 through 42. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. It's, it's fascinating. I hope you see this. It's fascinating. Jesus doesn't simply say you passively accept things from others, but rather you offer up the right cheek as well. You don't just go one mile, you go two miles. If somebody takes your tunic, you give him your cloak as well. If somebody begs from you, you do more, you give him more than he's asking. You don't turn away people who are taking from you or asking from you. In my view, this is some of the most difficult teaching of all of Scripture. And sometimes we do cartwheels on this text, talking about all the things it doesn't mean. But it seems like Jesus wasn't a bad communicator, and he didn't say things he didn't mean. The tone and tenor of this sermon is Jesus is calling us to do the hard thing. To do the difficult thing. There is no way, it seems to me, to read Jesus as saying Christianity can be a passive thing. I just don't do the bad thing. He is saying not only do you avoid the bad, but you do the good. This is an active thing. Let me apply this in a couple of places. What about us in the church? Uh, Philippians 2, 4, and 5. Listen to Paul. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Look not only on your own interests, but also to the interests of others. What's he saying? In the church, you find somebody else in this church, and you actively serve, actively do. That's what he's saying. You don't just, well, I didn't, I didn't, hurt, I didn't hurt anybody. He's saying you serve them. You think about what this looks like in the context of the home. What about in your marriage? You see, the spirit of Jesus is, think about the golden rule in the context of your marriage. Those of you who are married, it's not just not doing the irritating thing, but rather it's doing the blessing thing. It is doing the active thing. It's serving her, serving him, serving your parents, serving your children, serving your siblings. It's an active golden rule thing. I'm going to be aggressively pursuing the good thing on behalf of my spouse or my family member. What about what about in the church? How do, how do we in the church live the golden rule out? I'd suggest to you as a church to think seriously about how to organize your efforts and how to be involved in doing the work of ministry in a way where you're a blessing, an active and visible blessing in the community. And I know you're already doing that. I know that you're, you're, you're seeking ways that you can be a blessing to Jasper. Only that we might even ask even more seriously and even more deeply and even more often and more consistently, how do we take the golden rule? How do we not just sit here as a church and and, and to, to my context at home, sit there as a church and think about, Man, the world is so bad and people are so evil and they don't care about spiritual things anymore. And um, there's so much a problem with drugs and alcohol and addiction and divorce and all these things going on in our community. And, man, it's an awful place. It's to do something more than that. It's, it's to think, okay, how are we going to do something about that? How are we as a church going to be actively involved in our communities? And it's not this passive sit back and let it happen sort of thing, but an active, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to be involved in the word, the do idea of the golden rule is to be 
out there and to be actively engaged in our communities in ways where people can see it. We don't do it to be seen, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. It's not our goal. We do it so Jesus might be seen. You know, we do it so he might be glorified. It's not about us. But it is an active thing. The salt of the earth only influences that which it touches. The light of the world only influences places where it goes. And so it is an active sort of thing, the golden rule. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Here's the second word, the word whatever. Whatever. Verse 12. Whatever. What does whatever mean? It seems to me that Jesus, consistent with his nature, he was very indiscriminate here in his use of the word whatever. He's trying to communicate this idea of, of kind of indiscriminate blessing. He's, um, it's this idea of, man, just do whatever you can do. Be, I read a book a while back called, I think, it was, I think the name was Scandalous Grace or something like that. Maybe that was the subtitle of the book, about God's scandalous grace. You know, the thing about, the thing about Jesus that got him in trouble with uh, the religious power brokers of his day is that he, he forgave a lot more than they wanted him to. He was a little bit too liberal with his forgiveness. He, man, he would forgive people, and he would hang out with people from all sorts of walks of life. He would go to the wrong side of town. He hang out in the wrong kind of places. He, ate, he sat down and ate meals with the wrong kind of people, and it just got him in all sorts of trouble. And that's ultimately what got him killed, what got him murdered, was Jesus was scandalous in his distribution of grace. And so Jesus, in, in the golden rule, he says, whatever, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. It seems to me that we as individuals and we at churches, we ought to get in trouble because we do so much good. We, we ought to do so much good that people question our motives. We ought to, we ought to be so engaged in, in liberality in, the, in our giving and in our time and in our sacrifices that people think we're up to something. You know, I, mean, I just really think that, that Jesus is calling us to, to his, this kind of perspective, this do, what, whatever, whatever you want people to do, you, you just get involved doing that in other people's lives. And I just wonder what it would look like if we as individuals really took that seriously, if we as churches got involved in our communities in ways that made people suspicious about us. Because, man, nobody's that good. You know, nobody does that much. Nobody, nobody loves that much. Nobody is that filled with grace. That's what they thought about Jesus. What are his motives? You know, why is he doing all this stuff? Why is he hanging out with the wrong kind of people? Why is he giving so much? Why is he forgiving so bountifully? I mean, isn't that what he meant when he told stories like the one in Matthew 18 about the man who uh, a fellow owed him 10,000 talents and 10,000 talents was, it wasn't really supposed to put a number value on it, I don't think. To them, that represented more than you can pay back in 100 lifetimes, 1,000 lifetimes. Can't ever pay it back forgave him. Scandalous. Scandalous to do that. You don't do that. People need to pay their debts. You know, it's this idea of the whatever kind of thing. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, you do to them. Here's a third word. Third word is others. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Others. Who are the others here? Who do you think? Who, who are the others here? Think about it with me for a minute. I've already mentioned this a couple of times, and I just it, I think it's important for us to recognize Jesus was a servant of the others. He was someone who spent time with the others. And the others, in the context of Jesus' ministry, it includes those who've messed up big time and I may have mentioned this to you a while back, but when I went back and tried to read the gospel accounts with fresh eyes and started trying to figure out, you know, what really mattered to Jesus. Because I grew up in a very strong church environment, strong Christian home. It's hard sometimes to read the Bible with fresh eyes when you've, grew, when you've grown up in it, you know. But I think it's important for us to do that and to try our best to see Jesus as he was and who he was as someone who reached out to the others of his world. And you look at the life of Jesus, the Samaritan woman of John 4. She was a woman, which was a strike against her in that world, marginalized. She was a Samaritan woman, which strike two in her world, 
at least in the world Jesus came out of, the Jewish world. She was not only a woman, she was not only a Samaritan woman, but she was a, a woman who had been married five times and had given up on the institution of marriage entirely, apparently, which is living with a sixth guy. So she was a woman, she was a Samaritan, so she's, she's a wrong gender, she's a wrong ethnicity, and she's lived a wrong lifestyle, John 4. And yet Jesus ministered to her. You got John 8, the woman caught in the very act of adultery, thrown at his feet. What, what do you think? The law says this. What do you think ought to be done to her? Jesus went to uh, uh, Matthew 19, went to the house of uh, Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Wrong occupation, wrong past. He was ostracized by everybody else, and yet Jesus went to him. The others, it's just Jesus called children to him, and he said, unless you become like these children, you can't be a part of the kingdom. Children in the first century world weren't the center of the world as they are today in our, in our society. Children were on the margins of society. They were worthless. They were, they were um, expected to, to, to be out here somewhere and let the adults you know, be in the center. So Jesus called them over. Jesus always was over there with the others, whoever they were, the children, women who were ostracized and mistreated, treated as objects, uh, sinful people, the tax collectors. He was over here, people who drank too much. He was over here with the prostitutes. He was over there, whatever it was. Jesus was called a, you know, a, a wine bibber and all these accusations because he was, he was over there wherever the margins were. That's where Jesus was, over there. And he was saying, the others, I'm going to get out there with the others. I don't think this word others just means other people. It means that. It means more than that. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Find who the others are and do the whatever thing for them. Who are the others? I wonder... You know, I've thought about how do, you, how do you apply this today? How do you apply this today? Who are the others in your world? Who are the unlovables in your world? Who are the untouchables in your world? I don't think he's talking about Auburn fans, but, or Alabama fans, or, but maybe he would include them, us, you know. I think he's talking about, I think he's talking about whoever it is we find hard to love. Whatever... Your political party is. What about that other party? Do you think Jesus might be talking here about people with whom we disagree about very fundamental things? Do you think he might be talking about people in the LGBTQ community? Is he talking about people who are of a different ethnicity than we are? Is he talking about people that we have fundamental disagreements with, about life, about uh, God, about what we believe to be at the core of what it means to be human. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, you do also to the others. This is the law of the prophets. The way that you look at the word others, if you interpret that in the, in the context of the law and the prophets, you go back there and look at what Jesus says about the stranger, about the other, the marginalized. He's saying, love them. Love them. Let me read you something. I, I want to read this to you because I want, I want it to be this, this way. I don't want to misstate this because I want, you, I want you to hear this. One of the most pressing questions for the church in our age is how we remain faithful to biblical teaching on sensitive moral issues while living the golden rule toward the people in those communities. I believe that statement is true. And it seems like this is a hard thing. This is a hard thing. Doesn't it doesn't seem like it. It is a hard thing. How do we, let me give you an example. How do we in the church maintain a commitment to biblical moral teaching, for example, on sexuality? How do we maintain a commitment to biblical moral teaching on homosexuality while at the same time exhibiting compassion and love for people in that community? How do we do that? See, what I'm seeing in the world, in the Christian world, in the religious world today is it's so easy to get off base. I'm seeing churches that are abandoning biblical teaching about sexuality, embracing um, homosexuality as a perfectly legitimate alternate lifestyle consistent with biblical teaching. That's what that's, that's, I believe this is going to be a, a thing that's going to divide Christianity in, in the next 30 years. It's, it's happening. So, so you got that. And, and, and in the name of love, let's embrace people who have, 
who, have, uh, who are living, acting on same-sex attraction, for example. Let's love them. And what they mean by love is let's accept that lifestyle, that practice as, as biblical. Some churches are doing that. Some, in reaction, maybe because it's such a sensitive and it's, we have such extreme feelings about it, we push back from that. And the other extreme is we are not going to do that. But in our effort and in our, in our hurrying to maintain the truthfulness of biblical teaching, we communicate distaste. We communicate, in some cases, hate though I know that word is used in ways that I don't think I don't think they're right, but sometimes maybe. Sometimes distaste or hate or or uh, being or it's kind of this um, looking down at, a condescension toward. See what I'm saying? I think Jesus is teaching us in the golden rule that somehow we've got to be able to maintain a real commitment to biblical teaching while at the same time loving. And blessing. That's what Jesus did. It's a mar- marvelous thing about him. Somehow, the only perfect human being who's ever walked the planet was the one around whom the sinners felt most comfortable. How did that happen? Because so often in our pursuit of holiness, we can communicate this, this kind of environment where sinners don't feel invited to be there because we're too good. Or they think we're too good or too holy or too holier than thou or whatever. Jesus somehow was able to maintain that balance, and it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule. Let me sum it up. I'm going to close by saying this. I hope if I've done my job up until this point, then you ought to be sitting there thinking, I can't do that. Because I think to an extent that's the way we read the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Matthew 7, 12, the distillation of the Sermon on the Mount, it, it ought to be something like this. I can't do that. I I can't, I can't, I simply can't do that. I can't do the hard thing for people I don't like. I can't do the difficult thing. You know, I I just can't do that. So there's a sense in which we walk away from any reading on the Sermon on the Mount, if we've understood it correctly, by saying, I, in my humanness, simply cannot do that. And so I want to close with this. The only way anybody can ever obey the Sermon on the Mount, specifically the only way we can ever obey the golden rule is because is when we view it like this. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of the prophets. We do the whatever thing for others. Here's the key part. Reading this in the context of the New Testament. We do the whatever thing for others because of what has already been done for us. This is the only way we live it. It's when we recognize in the biblical narrative, you know who the others are? We are. We're the undeserving ones. We're the people in the ostracized community. We're the ones who've made a mess of it all. We're the ones who are unlovable, untouchable, and unredeemable. That is us. But what happened? God in his commitment to holiness and his commitment to love looked down on us in our reveling in rebellion against him. He looked down on us with love and he picks us up out of the dirt and he washes us in the blood of Christ. And when we as Christians fully acknowledge that and fully believe it, I mean, believe it with every fiber of our beings. We are unlovable, and yet he loves us. We're unredeemable, and yet he redeems us. When we really believe that, then we will never look at another human being and say, you're outside of the reach of God's grace. We'll never do that. We'll never see somebody out here and think, you know what? I was bad, but I wasn't that bad. I did some bad things, but you, you, you take it to another level. See, when we, when we view this in the context of what Jesus is teaching us in this golden rule, We're the others, and God is the one who did for us what we needed to be done for us. He's the one who went to the cross, and on that Friday morning when he went to Golgotha, there was the golden rule in all of its color, in all of its beauty, and all of its ugliness, and all of its glory. That's where you see it. That's where we were loved in spite of who we are. 
And then Jesus says, because you have been loved like that, you love other people. In fact, John puts it that way in 1 John 4. He says, we love, you can probably finish this, we love, why? Because he first loved us. It's the only way. That's why Christians are the most loving people in the world. Because we know how much we've been loved and how much we don't deserve it. And yet when we feel that, when we truly believe it, not just an intellectual thing, but, but it permeates us. We intellectually and emotionally with every fiber of our being, we believe how much we've been loved, how much we don't deserve it. And then that just frees us up to be scandalous in the way that we live out the golden rule in our communities. And I think that's what we're going to have to do as churches in our communities for us to break down some of these barriers that have been built in, in society in, uh, in our you know, late modern or postmodern time or whatever where we live in order for us to break down those barriers we got to be willing to, to get involved in our communities in ways where people can see these people. There's something different about these folks. We, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Second Corinthians 5.21. And that's what we're trying to do as Christians is to be golden rule people outside of these walls, you know, to break down some barriers. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, as we already said today, uh, this church invites you to come. We stand here. As, uh, as, the, as the hands of God, as it were, and as the hands of Jesus, and, and reach those hands out and invite you to come to him with faith in your heart, trusting in him, being willing to say to him, Lord, I've, um, I've made a mess of things, but I, whatever I am, I, th- I throw it at your feet, and I humbly, I humbly ask your forgiveness. And he scandalous, scandalously extends his forgiveness to all of us. What a beautiful thing it is. You trust in him with all of your heart. Be baptized for the forgiveness of all of your past sins. And the blood of Christ just washes over you and and frees you of every sin you've ever committed. Beautiful, beautiful thing, the story of the gospel. It's the golden rule in action. God's showing us how it's done. If you're ready to become a Christian this afternoon, you can come forward. If you need to come back and ask for prayers of the church, you've obeyed the gospel at some time in the past, but want to make things right with your creator and with the church family here at 6th Avenue, Why don't you come now? Uh, God welcomes all who come to him in penitence. Let's stand and sing this song. Why don't you come?